good evening uh, good afternoon and good morning uh, to everyone joining us depending on where you're joining us from uh, i'm sarthak bakchi and i teach at the school of arts and sciences at ahmedabad university and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the beginning of the seminar and lecture series uh, for the year 2021 uh, and today we are fortunate to have among ourselves uh, nobel laureate scientist dr venki ramakrishnan uh, the seminar and lecture series is a platform uh, in which we try to uh, invite distinguished scholars and great thinkers of our times uh, to come and engage with the students and faculty members at ahmedabad and uh, at ahmedabad university uh, and uh, the pandemic has definitely brought us closer to achieving our goals in which we have tried to get uh, as many scholars uh, as possible from different parts of the of the world and transcending different geographical as well as time uh, boundaries uh, so we couldn't have hoped for a better start to the year 2021 uh, when every the entire world is looking more hopeful and with the vaccine coming in and everything we couldn't have actually uh, started off the year 2021 uh, in a better way uh, than with a very promising conversation between uh, dr patrick french and dr venki ramakrishnan so without further ado uh, let me invite uh, uh, Simran Nasra, our PhD student at Ahmedabad University, uh, to introduce uh, our, our speaker for today, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan. Uh, Simran. Thank you, Sadak, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm Simran Nasra, a second year PhD student at the Biological and Life Sciences Division at the School of Arts and Sciences at Ahmedabad University. I'm working in the lab that focuses on nanobiotechnology, and my research interest lies in the area of targeted drug delivery. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the first seminar and lecture series virtual event of 2021 organized at the School of Arts and Sciences. Amongst us today, we have a revolutionary thinker and a biologist, Professor Venkatraman Ramakrishnan. A Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Ramakrishnan, is best known for his work on the elucidation of atomic structure of ribosomes. He has made numerous contributions in the field of biology, and his research has yielded fundamental insights that have greatly advanced our understanding of the ribosomes. Dr. Ramakrishnan elucidated the atomic structure of 30S ribosomal subunit and subsequently shed light on the other structures of the entire ribosome in altered states and in complexes with several antibiotics. Recently, he has been using electron microscopy to visualize ribosomes in action in higher organisms. His work has contributed considerably to the research on how the ribosome functions and how antibiotics inhibit it. He has also worked on histone and chromatin structures, which reinforced our understanding of how the DNA is organized within the cells. Akin to many famous biologists like Max Gilbrook and Francis Crick, he started his uh, career as a physicist, but later found his true calling as a researcher in biology. He realized that he didn't yearn to do calculations in theoretical physics, but rather was interested in making revolutionary discoveries in the field of biology. From getting elected as a member of European Molecular Biology Organization and the US National Academy of Sciences, to winning awards like Louis Jonte Prize for Medicine, the Datta Lecturership, and the Medal of the Federation of European Biochemical Societies, these many achievements serve as a proof of his excellence. In 2009, Dr. Ramakrishnan was, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, along with Thomas Stites and Ada Yunath. In 2010, he received India's second highest civilian honor, the Padma Vibhushan. He was knighted in 2012 UK New Year Honors for the services to molecular biology and served as the president of the Royal Society from 2015 to 2020. He is a fellow of Trinity College at the University of Cambridge, the Indian National Science Academy, the Royal Society, and the Academy of Medical Sciences, Somerville College at Oxford. He holds degrees from institutions like Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda, University of Utah, and University of Cambridge. Your contributions to the world of science are remarkable, and your work in life serve as an inspiration for many aspiring researchers and biologists like us. We at Ahmedabad University are honored to have you with us today. Webinars and forums such as this give us students the opportunity to engage closely with deep thinkers and persons of eminence invited from different fields for a meaningful discussion. We at Ahmedabad University strive to create an environment that, in, that inspires curiosity, encourages inquiry, and rewards research. I would now like to call on the deans, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Professor Patrick French, to take this conversation forward. 
Thank you very much, uh, Simran, and uh, a very big welcome to uh, Dr. Venki Ramakrishnan. Um, it's uh, great to have you with us today. And the format will be that we will be in conversation. We'll talk a little bit, um, I think, initially about the uh, gene machine and the race to, re to, to decipher the secrets of the ribosome. Uh, we'll also talk a bit about your early years in uh, Gujarat and in, uh, in Baroda. Uh, and then some more general questions before going to a Q&A with the students and the um, faculty. Um, I think probably by way of anecdote, I should mention at the beginning that we, we first uh, saw each other at the Jaipur Literature Festival a few years ago, when you were a member of the audience uh, and uh, the, the, the professor from Harvard, Sven Beckett, was talking about imperial history and the cotton trade. And I had said as the moderator, only students should be asking questions. And then I see this guy who looks a bit old to be a student and he's grabbed the mic and he actually has a very good question that Professor Beckett has trouble in answering. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, it's like, it's Venki Ramakrishnan. So that was the, the first <laughs> meeting. <laughs> but um, I, I think what that, uh, what that showed is that you're not somebody who stands on ceremony. Uh, you're not suffering from what you refer to in your writing as nobleitis, people who become very sort of full of their own pomp and circumstance. Uh, you, love to, you love to engage and you love to speak. Um, so, so let's start with, with going back to the, uh, the race to de decipher the secrets of the ribosome. Now, in, in the, the book Gene Machine, you, um, you, you give some, some sort of hints early on that you have uh, ambitions which are very broad, you decide that biology is where the action is uh, as a fairly young student, rather in the way that it was in physics at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you're very interested to know everything about solving crystals. You don't want someone else to be able to run the lab while you just sit back. You're very, you're very sort of engaged early on. And then there comes a, a moment really sort of towards the middle of the book when you realize that there is uh, a, 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 a true discovery in front of you. Now, I wondered if you could just say a little bit about that and that kind of process of thinking in those early days when you were a, a postdoc. Yeah, so I think, you know, when I was uh, in high school, uh, I was turned on to science by a, a variety of circumstances, including a, a very good teacher. Um, my parents were scientists, but I wasn't so keen on it until that point. And I think my mother also had some uh, influence on trying to get me interested in science. But um, I wanted to be a physicist because there, there's, there's this sort of arrogance, hierarchical arrogance. You know, there's a very famous cartoon by XDCK, which shows, you know, sociologists, psychologists, biologists, chemists, physicists, all as a kind of hierarchy. And then, you know, mathematicians uh, way out at the other end, uh, each one purer than the other. And so I wanted to be a physicist, but when I started doing problems in physics, I realized it was actually very hard to make uh, big breakthroughs in physics. Uh, physics was a mature field. Uh, it's in, in a sense, it's much older than modern biology. I mean, genetics is perhaps 150 years old and uh, physics is about uh, several hundred years old. Uh, so uh, I would say um, that really uh, changed my attitude. And I thought, well, actually biology seems to be where all the action is. The one key decision I made was I decided since I didn't know any biology, I shouldn't actually uh, jump into some area of biology because I would just know a little bit about that particular area. And uh, I wouldn't know uh, what it was like to know the whole field. And so I decided to go back to graduate school, uh, which was essentially going backwards five years in a way. Uh, and so I went to California, went back to graduate school. And then after two years, I realized I didn't need a second PhD and I went off to do a postdoc. But those two years were actually crucial. They gave me a broad uh, foundation. And it does say something about educational systems. In the US, the system was flexible enough that even though I had a PhD in physics, 
there were universities that would admit me as a graduate student, uh, you know, as a first year graduate student. That wouldn't happen in many countries. And in fact, many universities, even in the US, uh, wouldn't consider me as a graduate student because I, they said, you've already got a PhD. So I think that that sort of flexibility is quite important. What about, what about the, the, the moment when you realized that you were going to make some breakthrough which could be historically significant? Yes, that was uh, interesting as well. The one thing, I, I would say the one thread throughout my life is that I kept giving myself chances. Mm -hmm. So I was stuck in a dead end technique. And so I decided, well, I need to go off and learn a more powerful technique, which happened to be crystallography. So I actually came here to Cambridge on sabbatical to learn that technique. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the sabbatical, a, a piece of work I'd done suggested that you could use the technique for really much bigger problems, uh, like the ribosome, which has about half a million atoms, mm -hmm. and, and which was sort of beyond what uh, people thought was, uh, you know, possible at the time. Uh, although few of us realized that it was possible and, and, and went after it. But that moment when you realize actually you could, if you use this method, solve this big problem that you know, the field is waiting for, uh, that was actually one of the more exciting moments in my life. Uh, but it, didn't, it wasn't sort of a eureka moment. It takes a while to sink in. Then it takes a while to believe yourself. And then it takes a while to develop the courage to say, yes, I'll do it. And then it takes a while to actually organize it. You know, you have to figure out how to get started, convince, you know, young people to go into it uh, and give it a shot and so on. So it required a bunch of different skills, you know, and some internal courage as well, but also skills of persuasion and skills of organization, uh, which we don't think about as scientific traits. Right, but without that, it would never, it would never have been, been possible. No, I think if I tried to struggle on it on my own, struggle with it on my own, I would have uh, been blown away essentially by, by events. And I, I think having really talented people and another thing is to make them feel that the problem, they own the problem. They have to feel vested in it uh, so that it's as much their problem as my problem. And that way, you know, they work hard, they think imaginatively, and, and they work collaboratively. So I think that's uh, another lesson I learned is how to, you know, manage egos and, and get people all pulling in the same direction. So, so when, you, when you saw what you, what you thought might be, in your words, a secret bullet, uh, which would sort of unlock the entire ribosome, at that time, uh, were people understanding why it was important? You mentioned, for example- a... Oh, yes. Yeah. The, so the ribosome was discovered in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as soon as the structure of DNA was discovered, mm -hmm. people wanted to know how does DNA actually encode information? And, and the information is basically on how to make proteins. And in the 50s, people realized that there was this large object called the ribosome, which is where it all happened. And so it was at the crossroads between genes and the products that the genes specify. So it's right at the crossroads of modern biology. And actually, ribosomes impinge on almost everything uh, in biology. And so there's no question that it was a major, uh, you know, goal in biology. But you see, you said that there was like, a, was it a radio program where somebody was complaining that they were studying the entire eye and all you were studying was just the ribosome? Yes, <laughs> that was very funny. This was a, there's a, there used to be a very famous, uh, a very popular show called Material World on BBC. And the host said that the previous guest uh, that is the previous week, the guest had been complaining about this. And I said, well, the ribosome not only makes most of the eye, but it makes mo most of everything else in every living form, including the millions of forms that don't even have eyes. So uh, of course uh, it ought to be <laughs> you know, more important. <laughs> So you, you, you go on this, this journey and you, you sort of, you, you, des you describe even the physical journey about how your 
You know, one minute you're in a, a Ford Fiesta, the next you're in a People Carrier. You're going from New Haven to Tennessee, you're going to Utah, you're going to Cambridge, UK. And then the, the, there comes this sort of uh, moment in, in around sort of 99, 2000, which I guess is exactly the same time that you were shifting from US to UK, when you realize that this is actually, uh, this is happening. And rather in line with what you're saying about there not being a eureka moment, you also talk about some of the very practical things and the fact that you make a rookie error when you are setting up the uh, the experiment. This is when you are in uh, Argonne and you're, yes. you're, you're, you know, the, da the data is useless. And and then suddenly you, 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 you correct the little rookie error and then you realize it's happened. Yeah, no, no. The, so, so yeah, we had we we were in Cambridge by then. We had uh, spent almost, uh, I think, uh, close to a year in Cambridge, about ten months or so, and we all had to fly out to Chicago with these crystals, and then drive up to Argonne, which is uh, about an hour away from O'Hare Airport. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when you get two days of beam time at these synchrotrons, you have to work round the clock. Uh, you can't just go to go to sleep because then you uh, lose half your time. So we had worked out all these shifts, uh, and we're all a bit tired. and And I did make this rookie error, but luckily it was corrected by the guy who ran the beam line. Uh, he's the one who said, you know, you might want to use a smaller, uh, you know, oscillation. It's a, you know, it's it's a question of how finely you sample your data. He said you might want to sample your data more finely. And uh, that of course gave us, uh, actually prevented us from uh, making a really fairly bad mistake. It would have, we'd still have got a structure but it wouldn't have been uh, as good or as detailed and might not have been enough. So uh, yes, and at the end of that, we weren't sure that the experiment had worked. And there uh, a postdoc of mine had actually made a slight error a, a different error in a script to analyze the data. And it looked like it hadn't worked and I was really dismayed. And then uh, I spotted the error and we instantly resubmitted the program uh, with the corrected uh, script. And, you know, bingo, all these uh, so-called peaks popped out in the analysis. And it was at that moment that I knew that the, the problem had been solved. And uh, I, I, I write in the book that I, you know, it was months and months of stress, you know, suddenly released and 48 hours of, you know, sleep deprived, uh, you know, pr uh, data collection. And I, I remember dancing around the office, you know, saying, we're going to be famous, we're going to be famous. <laughs> and I had this technician who didn't quite understand, you know, what this meant and, you know, he didn't, certainly he didn't understand the details of the program. And he sort of, I remember him looking at me with this sort of bemused expression, you know, uh, has the boss gone insane or what, you know, but, but I'm sure he realizes now what, what it meant. And you, you, you write very uh, honestly and openly about the, the difficulties of rivalry uh, versus collaboration with scientists internationally when everybody's sort of going for a particular outcome. Um, you also, you talk about the Nobel Prize sort of in a, in a very objective way uh, in terms of how it is now compared to how it might have been when it was first conceived in the sort of early years of the 20th uh, century. Um, you, you, you also describe how when you get the phone call from Stockholm that uh, you think is this like a a friend or a colleague putting on a very good Swedish accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were reasons for that. Well, one is um, the there's a, the, the, you you've asked about three different uh, things there. One is the collaboration versus competition issue, which always keeps coming up. Now, among the liberal academic uh, colleagues, there is a certain what I call the land of wokedom. Uh, the, there is this thing that you have to be collaborative, that competition is really bad. Everybody should be nice and collaborative with each other. That works in some cases, and in some cases it's absolutely essential. For example, if you wanted to discover the Higgs boson, you have to get thousands of people to collaborate. Or you know, if you want to do the LIGO experiment or things like that. 
But there are many other cases where competition has actually speeded up uh, you know, uh, science because it forces people to work faster and harder and think smarter, et cetera. It's the same reason as in business, competition often results in uh, better products, cheaper products, better for the consumer, et cetera. And it's the same thing in science. And scientists are not any different from other human beings. You know, we go into it for a variety of reasons. We have egos, we, have, uh, we want recognition, but we also want to uh, search for the truth. So it's a very big mixture. And, and even in my own experience, I had these competitors, but I also had lots of people who helped me with no thought of any, getting anything back. Mm. So life is a mixture of altruism, and uh, selfishness and, and collaboration and competition. And, and science is simply a microcosm of life. Uh, so, so that's one thing. The other is about prizes. Well, uh, we talked about the Nobel Prize. The trouble is the Nobel Prize was a war started in 1901. 1901, people would only meet once every few years at meetings. And by the time there were no Zoom calls and no emails. So no Zoom calls, there were no airplanes. <laughs> and people would just and, and travel was quite expensive. Mm. And so people would meet once every few years. And what would what each person would do would tell you what they had done in the last few years. So by the time they disclosed it to other people, they'd already done a large body of work. So it's very clear who had done something. Okay, uh, but now what happens is, you know, you go to a meeting, you hear a germ of an idea, you email it to all your friends, certainly to your lab, etc., and it just spreads like wildfire. And then other people pick up on this. And it's very hard to know what was the key thing that made this possible. It's not necessarily the first thing that's the key step. So I think, you know, prizes and, on, and finally, this, these scientific enterprise is many orders of magnitude bigger than it was uh, you know, in 1901. If you look at the sheer number of scientists and you know, the number of prizes is still the same. You know, the number of Nobel prizes is still the same. So, so the idea that you'd be able to select, first of all, you won't be able to select all the important discoveries and then you won't be able to select all of the relevant people. So I think this does raise the question of what these prizes are about. And the best way to take them as is as this kind of token. It's a way to uh, spotlight science in the public's uh, mind, uh, you know, once a year or so. And uh, then the other thing is about Nobelitis. And this is, uh, people should realize that if you get a Nobel prize for your work on the ribosome, it means you're an expert on, on that aspect of the ribosome. I'm not even an expert on everything about the ribosome, okay? So uh, for me to, you know, pontificate about, you know, climate change or, you know, this or that, it, it, it's just, you know, uh, it, it's just phony, okay? So th th that's what I object to. Okay, let's, let's go, go backwards um, a little bit now. Uh, Venkita, when you were um, in Gujarat, when you were in uh, Baroda, Vadodara, you were at uh, MS University of Baroda. But before that, I know that you spent your, your early years of learning at a girls' school. So, did <laughs> that you? yeah, let me see if I can find a picture of it. You know, uh, it, it'd be very interesting for people to see. When my parents moved uh, to Gujarat, I was three years old. In fact, the earliest memory I have is standing by a playground and not knowing what anybody said uh, because I only spoke Tamil at that point. Mm -hmm. And so my parents decided to send me to the only English school in town. And there's only one English school in Baroda. Uh, it appears that Macaulay is even more influential after independence than he was before because now you see a proliferation of English medium schools. But at the time there was only one. And um, that was the convent of Jesus and Mary school. But when I was in third grade, uh, a, a kind of a fraternal school called the Rosary High School decided to open up an English medium division. 
And so the nuns who ran my school said, we're not going to accept boys anymore, but the boys who are already here will be allowed to finish. But if you leave the school, you won't be able to, you won't, we won't readmit you, okay? Mm -hmm. So the result was that the boys kept leaving year after year, but no new boys were allowed to take their place. And so when I was uh, in sort of eighth grade or something, uh, this is what my uh, class looked like. So I'll just show you. Okay, so there, there we are. So you can see they're mostly girls and the boys are sort of sprinkled on the ends. You know, this around this time, it was sort of a one to four ratio. I, I don't know if uh, any of you can figure out who I am, uh, but you know, it's, that's not the important thing about the picture anyway. So <laughs> there we are. We, we want you to tell us which, uh, which of them you are. Oh, uh, I'm the one here, the second from the right okay. in this okay. row. Yeah. <laughs> the second row, second from the, well, second from the right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, tell us a bit more about your, your schooling up to the age of uh, 18, 19. What were, the, what were the good and the bad bits of it? How has it affected the way that you've worked subsequently? And what has what is well, happened from it? You know, like many of these... Um, convent schools, there was a big emphasis on doing well and, you know, doing well in exams and so on. And uh, there was quite rigorous discipline. Although I have to say, I did actually cut classes, uh, you know, quite often, especially on Saturdays. Uh, and, and when there were phys ed classes, my friend and I would just sort of disappear uh, and <laughs> so I was not exactly a model student, I, sh I should say. Uh, and um, the, the other thing was that, as I told you, we did have this one very good teacher who really was rigorous about uh, physics and mathematics and, and chemistry and so on. Uh, I did, I, I think another thing that helped me was essay writing and, and writing in English. Uh, that really helped me throughout my life because English, whether we like it or not, has become the de facto international language for many things, including science. And uh, so that was the, the good part. The bad part is I didn't learn Indian language as well. I had to learn Hindi. I was, uh, I, I had to I got an exemption from learning Gujarati. So my Gujarati is very primitive, sort of just enough to go shopping, that sort of Gujarati. And, uh, you know, there's a whole literature and culture associated with uh, Indian languages. And I think I missed out uh, on that. So in a sense, I, I like to joke, uh, we'll come to Macaulay later if, you, if we have time, but I like to joke that I am actually a victim of Macaulayism in a way. Uh, so, um, so that was the good and the bad. And then I had the chance to go somewhere else for uh, my undergraduate. And two things happened. One is I was only 15 when I graduated from school and my parents thought I was too young to go off somewhere else. Uh, they were worried that I would get into bad habits get into drugs, uh, things like that. And so they wanted me to stay at home. And uh, by a strange coincidence, the MS University had also had a few professors who had returned from abroad and had instituted a quite a modern curriculum in physics. And so I had actually, and by the time I had also acquired a scholarship, which only allowed you to do basic science. You couldn't do medicine or engineering. And so I rejected uh, admission to medicine, uh, much to my father's dismay, I should say, and, and decided to uh, study physics instead uh, and did quite a modern course in physics, uh, which I think prepared me you know, reasonably well for, for going abroad. Well, as, as a route into uh, Macaulay and Hastings and Sir Richard Temple, let's talk about the Royal Society. Uh, you became uh, president uh, in 2015 and you served a, a distinguished five years, also you know, being a great science communi communicator, public science communicator at the same time. 
Um, but you were very conscious when you took on that role that you were new and different. You didn't look like any of the previous uh, heads yeah. of the society. And you're also, I know, somebody who's interested in the, the history of what an organization like the Royal Society was trying to do 100 or 200 years ago. Yeah, no, the Royal Society is very interesting. You know, to a scientist, uh, the Royal Society means something. You know, you think of Newton and Rutherford and you, and to an Indian, you think of some of the great Indian scientists, Ram, Ramanujan and C.V. Raman and, and people like that. Uh, but, you know, I was an outsider to Britain. I came to Britain uh, in my late 40s. I didn't have a network of people uh, you know, that I knew here. I knew no one in government uh, and very few uh, among the broader scientific community. I'd actually parachuted into the LMB, which is where I'm speaking to you from now, and, uh, you know, carried on doing my work. And so I was very surprised, first of all, to be asked uh, about the Royal Society uh, and, uh, you know, whether I wanted to be president. And I told them, look, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have any experience with this sort of, with policy work or, you know, broader leadership and so on, but they uh, ignored me. And I, I think partly they did it because, you know, I had a Nobel prize and I was, you know, uh, I had, they could see that I was reasonably good at communication and so on. And, and, and I think, well, whatever the reason they, they ended up electing me now, to scientists, the Royal Society means something. But, you know, if you go to Piccadilly Tube Station, which is only about a 10-minute walk from the Royal Society, and you ask the first 100 people, uh, what is the Royal Society and where is it? You know, the first question they would ask you is, the Royal Society of what? You know, <laughs> and most of them have ne would never have heard of it, you know. So, uh, so it is a weird thing where society is famous all over the wor world and has been distinguished uh, for many centuries. It's not so uh, much in the public's mind. Now, um, looking at the Royal Society was very interesting because when this whole thing about the BLM uh, movement came about, there was a question like, how many, how was the Royal Society involved in the slave trade? And of course, it turns out Many of the fellows of the Royal Society were actually, uh, you know, investors in the Royal Africa Company and so on. And it was very common in those days. And so I looked into the Royal Society and in India because my original feeling was that, you know, Royal Society had really brought science to India and, uh, you know, helped educate a whole generation of Indians in modern science and really brought India into sort of the modern scientific era. Uh, but it isn't quite so straightforward. Yeah, you know, the first people to be associated, the first fellows of the Royal Society connected with India were Robert Clive. Now, why was Clive an FRS? He, he didn't know any science, you know? He was a, a sort of a thug and an adventurer, uh, you know? Uh, you know, I, I, I could say he was very brave in terms of his battle plans and so on, and perhaps foolish. Uh, but it worked out and, you know, he helped establish British rule in India, but it didn't seem uh, a, a thing. And then Warren Hastings, uh, who was uh, quite a bit better than Clive, uh, but also, you know, uh, nothing really to do with science. Uh, you know, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. And then Macaulay uh, was a fellow of the Royal Society. And Macaulay is famous for uh, something I'll share with you because uh, every... Uh, Indian either knows this or should know this. So here we are. So can you see, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So here Macaulay says, I have never found one among them, meaning people who study Indian languages, who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. And then what he wanted was to create an educational system to produce Indians who would act as a bridge between India and Britain, between Britain and the masses of Indians. So this is the foundation of the Indian civil service. 
So he said, we must do at present, at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. You know, this was sort of a, 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 an astonishing thing that he, he thought that somehow the English had a monopoly on morals and intellect. Okay, so that's Macaulay. And then what happened as a result of Macaulay is that the British started, uh, you know, first of all, English as a, an, a language of higher education became universal in British controlled India and then eventually throughout most of India. And what happened is Indians started getting educated and then they realized, actually, look, we're just as smart as all these other, these, these Europeans, you know, we can learn all this stuff, it's no problem. And so the British were starting to get a little worried about this. And so this is about Richard Temple, who was the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Bengal. And he sent a letter to the Viceroy on the rising discontent in India because the Indians were saying, well, why are these people ruling us? You know, we, we should be ruling ourselves. So he lamented, this arises partly from our higher education being too much in the direction of law, public administration and prose literature, where they may possibly imagine, however erroneously, that they may approach to competition with us. Temple had a solution to offer, but we shall do more and more to direct their thoughts towards practical science, where they must inevitably feel their utter inferiority to us. Now, Temple also was a fellow of the Royal Society. Again, you know, in those days, I think FRS must have must stand for friends of the right sort. You know, if you were you had people who were in the club, they would they would put you up. So, um, so that was sort of the beginning. But then, you know, actually, the British did uh, bring in lots of people uh, who educated Indians in science. You know, there were people like George Everest, who was very famous for the Geological Survey of India, which was a fantastic, you know, accomplishment uh, in which many Indians were involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they set up educational institutions, mostly the universities and the three presidencies. And uh, as a result, Indians started becoming, uh, you know, knowledgeable about modern European science. And this eventually led to the first Indian Fellow of the Royal Society, whose centenary we celebrated when I was president, which is Ramanujan, the mathematician, who, you know, he was ignored, his letters were ignored by uh, a Harvard professor, but uh, G. H. Hardy in Cambridge, you know, as you know, invited him, and uh, he went on to uh, do great work. And then that led, that opened up the floodgates because once people realized, actually, look, we have this guy who doesn't even speak very good English. He didn't go to one of these fancy English schools. He was a, a you know, an ordinary Tamil guy, very conservative fellow, and he could go on and become a fellow of the Royal Society. So maybe I could too. And then, you know, you had C.V. Raman and Bose and Saha and, and you know, Chandrasekhar uh, was another brilliant guy. So I think those were, you know, um, so the Royal Society had some dubious origins, much like the British in India really had dubious origins. Uh, uh, but then, you know, eventually uh, there was both good and bad. And, and there was quite a lot of good, I would say. So as, as president of the Royal Society, how much do you feel there's still a hangover of those ideas from the 19th century? I mean, were they things that you ran up against or do you think it's a different time now? No, I think it's a very different time. I think the Royal Society is, is, is actually quite a progressive organization. It's very conscious of the gender disparity in science and particularly the ethnic disparity and not so much Indians as, as Africans. There are very few uh, fellows of African descent uh, in academia, let alone in the uh, Royal Society. And the Royal Society is very concerned with all sorts of problems such as climate change, biodiversity and so on. So I think in general, it really is a force for, for good, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, in, in terms of using science uh, for, for, to benefit society. 
So, so just before we, we go on to the, the more general um, Q&A, which will begin with uh, Professor Balaji Prakash as a question. I just want to ask you one more thing, which was, I know that in your role at the Royal Society, you were quite involved with public policy, uh, particularly in areas around the coronavirus pandemic. And one of the things that has been very strange to watch globally has been the way that different governments and different societies have responded to the pandemic. Uh, the idea of uh, negative liberty, that I have freedom not to wear a mask, that it's my freedom to go into Walmart and infect other people is found particularly in the US, but it's also noticeable in the UK uh, and in some other parts of the world. I mean, I mean, as somebody who's been between many different countries and cultures, yeah. would, you, would you care to speculate about some Yeah, of no, I, I'd be happy to. So I, so actually my entire presidency, all my plans, uh, you know, where I went to went away because I was yeah. the whole thing was hijacked by Brexit yeah. and then by the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, now, in the pandemic, it's striking that the that Asian countries. Uh, I don't mean India, but I mean East Asian and Southeast Asian countries ha have done extremely well. Okay, and uh, it's regardless of whether they're somewhat totalitarian, like uh, the Chinese government or whether they're like Korea or Taiwan uh, or Singapore, there's a whole spectrum of different types of governance. And yet they've all done fairly well. And Japan has done reasonably well. Uh, whereas European countries, uh, generally speaking, have not done so well. I mean, the UK is perhaps one of the worst ones, but I, it's not hugely different from France or Spain uh, or, or Sweden for that matter. And the US is, has also not done well. And this suggests to me uh, something you alluded to, Patrick, which is there is in the West an emphasis on individual rights versus community responsibility. It's always a balance. And I think, and particularly in Anglo-Saxon countries, there's much more of an emphasis on individual rights and libertarianism. Uh, whereas I think some of these Asian countries are much more community oriented. Now I have a feeling India is somewhere in between or possibly more on the side of individual uh, rights, you know, but uh, then say uh, Southeast Asia or Japan and so on. Uh, Indians love to argue, they don't like to be conformist. Uh, and, and, and so I, I would put it more Western in, in, its, in that respect. Uh, so I, I think that may be part of the reason uh, because it's not science, you know, at the, the public health response has to do with how efficiently you stop spreading the virus. And some of those basic facts are known. It's a respiratory virus. It spreads through, you know, mm. what we exhale and what we inhale. And, and so how do you stop that chain of transmission? It's not rocket science. And it really has to do with how rigorously you can enforce uh, rules. And, and in, in terms of the response that you got from government, what was it like? I think government, generally, the UK government is quite respectful and responsive uh, to scientists, but they will all not always do what scientists tell them. And this is because, and especially, I should say, a Tory government is pulled in multiple directions. Uh, they have an entire wing of their party who are very libertarian in outlook mm. and, and uh, also very libertarian in economic outlook. And so, uh, so the government is often trying to satisfy these multiple uh, concerns. And perhaps, you know, that, that's not the most efficient way to deal with a pandemic. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, I mean, I, I would even suggest possibly that it looks back to Macaulay and what you were talking about and the history of colonialism and the idea that, uh, you know, liberty should be exerted in a form which benefits people who benefit from liberty. So, I mean, you know, the, the most extraordinary thing about that quotation is that uh, Macaulay is able to make that commentary on all of the literature of India plus Arabia, despite not having any of the languages. So he wasn't able to say, after 50 years of study, I've concluded this. No, no, he says, I've talked to Orientalists, you know, so it was all hearsay. But, you know, you have to realize 
here with here with here was a country with which about you know 10 to 50, 20 thousand people you know had essentially taken over large tracts of india and dominated trade in india and uh, done much of that to you know the rest of the world and so uh, they had this sort of natural feeling of superiority i think if you were english in the uh, 17 and 1800s you would it, it would not be unreasonable to sort of believe that you were one of the greatest you know and many americans today say oh we live in the greatest country mm -hmm. and you know you ask them what are you the greatest at are you greatest at education at math scores at life expectancy you know they're not greatest at any of those but you you talk to an average american they would say we're living in the greatest country this is the greatest country it, it's just a kind of indoctrination but I, I, I think that that really came home to roost in a tragic way during the pandemic, that exact uh, attitude. Yes, I think so. I think this exceptionalism, yeah. what I call, uh, which, which operates in Britain as well as in the US, uh, does actually hurt you from yeah. you know, having the humility uh, to, to sort of make the right sorts of decisions. You know? I think that does, that does play an effect. So we've, we've got a couple of questions now from um, faculty in the Biological Life Sciences Division. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Balaji Prakash and then Professor Krishna Swami. Thank you very much, Professor Ramakrishna. It was so inspiring. I, just to interrupt, I would like to hear from the younger people like the students. Uh, Don't worry, they will, they will come in very, very soon after, okay. after Balaji and Krishna. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, so I, I was just saying thank you for that very, very uh, inspiring chat stories that we did not know about. So very nice to learn about that. I, I recall, uh, you know, the times when you're about your work and when you just got the prize and I met you in Eriche in that little conference in the town in Italy, along with Ada and uh, uh, Tom Stites and others. I remember that beautiful uh, mug. Uh, with with I was on painted on it if you if you recall that it was a wonderful yes. time chatting with you uh, on many things so I think just after that period is or around that corner is when you know the whole uh, story of how people started looking at antibiotics and fine tuning antibiotics had started in the West uh, I just wanted to ask you if you could share some of those stories of your own work and the others for the benefit of the students of uh, sure. So it turns out that about half of known antibiotics act on the ribosome and they work because bacterial ribosomes are slightly different from human ribosomes. So they can bind to bacterial ribosomes more tightly uh, and stop bacteria from functioning while not killing our own cells. Uh, so when these structures were solved, you could actually solve the structure with many different antibiotics. And this allows you then to look at how antibiotics actually bind in a pocket and whether you could design new chemicals that might bind in those pockets even better and perhaps overcome resistance. Now, as you know, antibiotic resistance is a global and growing problem. We've temporarily been distracted from it because of COVID but it has not gone away. And if it becomes a serious problem, it will make COVID look, you know, it could potentially make COVID look, you know, rather benign uh, by comparison. So uh, the trouble is companies started working on it and Tom Stites, uh, a fellow Nobel laureate of mine, uh, founded a company in New Haven and it did produce some interesting compounds, but when it tried to go public about uh, a decade ago, uh, it couldn't command the share price that uh, even a fraction of the share price that investors had already put in it. So the uh, IPO was withdrawn. And it was striking that the same month, a company that uh, specializes in sharing gossip and fake news was worth uh, hundreds of billions, okay? Uh, and we all know what Facebook has resulted in uh, today. And uh, so there's something broken about the way that antibiotic development is, is, is done. 
And we have to remember the very first modern antibiotic, penicillin, was not developed by the free market. It was developed by the British government, uh, you know, financing this effort at Oxford uh, to develop penicillin as a, as a medicine. And so I think governments, multinational organizations and charities uh, need to be uh, investing heavily in antibiotic research. Uh, and that's the way forward, not leave it up to uh, you know, private companies because the trouble with antibiotics is uh, there's not a lot of money in it because you cure, you give it to, for a week to a patient and the patient's cured. It's not like an anti-cholesterol drug or a blood pressure drug or, or even a cancer drug that you have to take over a prolonged period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go over to, um, to Krishna Swami, who is uh, a molecular biologist. <clears throat> Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, uh, the conversation was really good. And among the biographies, you know, scientific biographies, I would say that one of the most uh, uh, entertaining biographies is yours. Because if you look at the other ones, the technical biographies, sometimes that, sometimes tracks. But your biography is like really a good read uh, to, to go about. So that's one of my favorite biographies. It would have been great if you have here, come here, you could have got it autographed also. Well, perhaps I will some, you know, when things are, uh, you know, better and I visit Baroda, I can easily uh, stop by. Uh, but I have to tell you, you know, the, it, it was not original. Uh, the, it was modeled a little bit after the double helix. I tried to capture the frankness of the double helix without what I call the gratuitous nastiness uh, of the double <laughs> helix. And, and uh, actually Richard Dawkins uh, in his blurb refers to me as a kind of nice Jim Watson, but, you know, which is, which means that I've sort of landed exactly where I wanted to. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it is important to show to young people how science actually works and not sort of whitewash it and pretend that in hindsight, it was all very logical and, you know, very friendly and so on you know, actually science is blundering about and, you know, competing and, uh, you know, things like that. So uh, I have two questions, one, both of them connected. As I said, ribosome is one of the essential molecules of life in the sense that you need ribosome to generate any protein to translate, right? But if you look at it, the prokaryotic ribosomes are smaller than the eukaryotic ribosomes. There have been lots of changes that has happened. Now, if this is an essential process. Why do you have to tinker so much, make its size bigger? Because in terms of energy, it's not going to be more efficient. So what no, do you think is- No, that's a, that's a very good question. And it, it, you know, for instance, it's not the o that's not the only difference. For example, we in all of us have mitochondria in our hmm. cells, which are descended from bacteria. But mitochondrial ribosomes are very different from bacterial ribosomes, even though they've descended mm. from bacteria. Mm. And I think it has to do, my guess is it has to do with the fact that translation is much more regulated and controlled in higher organisms. Mm. And so a lot of this expansion of the ribosome has to do with binding to various regulatory factors, binding to initiation factors and so on, and allowing a much finer control of the process uh, than in bacteria. Yeah, so that, does that also mean that though ribosomes are one of the most conserved molecules, if you look at it, earliest molecules and conserved molecules, there's been a huge gain in loss of components in the sense that if you compare it between several species, even among the close lineages, you find that some of them are lost. And there have been several studies in which they have done deletions of up to like 22 components and still, are, still uh, the cell survives. So they're not yes. essential. So yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of these components are making the process more efficient. They may survive in the lab, but in the wild, they would quickly be outcompeted out. You, okay. you see what okay. I'm saying? They still have a defect. So, so living things have evolved for fitness in the wild, not in your laboratory culture. And uh, so I think that's the reason. But I should point out that the very core of the ribosome, where the heart of the action is, is very highly conserved. Yeah. yeah. Among, all, among the all, all the trees, across the tree of life. Yeah. Thank you very much.
So we've, we've now got a couple of uh, questions from uh, students. First of all, Monil uh, Shah and then Hadi Talwani. But just before Monil asks, I'm gonna share one question from the chat box, which is from Chandan Dalawat asking, is the protein folding problem solved by artificial intelligence? In other words, I guess the discoveries of recent uh, months, yeah. is, is this the change point? Yeah, so it is, there is no question. And I actually was privy to a kind of private, uh, you know, seminar by DeepMind. Uh, there is no question that it, it is a major, major advance in uh, predicting structure from sequence alone. Uh, I think we will know very quickly, uh, perhaps in the next few years, uh, how general it is and uh, how you know, completely reliable it is. But my guess is, uh, even if it isn't completely solved, it's, it's, it's a huge stride has been made in that direction. Okay, so a huge stride. Okay, so Monil Shah should be able to unmute and uh, ask his question, followed by uh, Hadi. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, the other, other day I was watching one of your interviews, I think with achievement. And uh, they wrote that uh, you applied to 50 places after your postdoc. And you said that you're lucky to have gotten the opportunity to work at a national lab. Now, my question to you is that, I mean, what would you suggest to someone who, who is following a similar track and who is looking for an opportunity? And do you always get an opportunity? Uh, <clears throat> well, firstly, you have to keep options open. If you want to stay in research, you have to somehow figure out how to give yourself a, 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 an option to keep working, okay, until you find the sort of job that you want. Uh, but I should tell you, throughout much of my career, I always had a plan B or even a plan C. For example, plan B might have been uh, to become a computer programmer. Of course, I couldn't do it today because every school child knows how to program. But in the 70s uh, and early 80s, that was still... A, a, a skill and some demand. Uh, the other thing I could have done was to become a high school teacher uh, in physics or in, in science uh, generally. And I thought if I'd become a high school teacher, I could have done, tried to be a very good teacher, you know, an inspiring teacher and so on. And it would have been a perfectly good life. Uh, so I think you can't be wedded to the idea that there's only one, you know, a path for you in life, you know, and if you somehow veer from that path, you're a failure. Uh, it isn't like that. You just simply have to figure out uh, your own way in life and, and you have to keep other options open. Okay, Hadi. Um, good evening, sir. It is an honor to be able to interact with you today. So my question, I have two questions actually. So one of the questions is that, um, in a country like India, with, which has far less researchers and uh, much less portion of GDP spent towards research, where is the role of science communication and what can undergraduates like us uh, who are in just second or third year, we can, what is our role in communicating science? And my second question is, what is, uh, like, as a young aspiring scientist, should you go to a, a field which is important in science or which is interesting to you? So, yeah, so, um, Thank you. so I think, firstly, I think India needs, if India wants to thrive uh, as a country, it needs to invest a lot more in science. Uh, if you look at China, China 50 years ago, uh, its science was probably not as good as India's, okay? Uh, before Deng Xiaoping, I would say Chinese science was not as good as the best Indian science. Of course, Indian science was highly non-uniform, uh, but the best Indian science was better. Uh, but there's no comparison today. You know, China is a global power in science. And it's because for 50 years, it has spent a an increasing fraction of its GDP uh, on science, research, infrastructure, and so on. Uh, if my feeling is the Indian government is not doing enough, but Indian industry is doing even less. Uh, in many cases, 
many Western countries, it's about a one to two ratio, one part government, two part private. In India, it's almost the opposite. So it's as if Indian industry is not doing anything at all uh, relative to its uh, proportion. Uh, so I think both of those uh, need to improve if India is going to compete in the 21st century. Without that, uh, you know, the days of cheap labor are going to disappear because of automation and lots of other uh, uh, things. And so India is not going to be able to thrive based on cheap labor. Okay, it, 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 ultimately, it's going to have to thrive based on becoming a knowledge-based economy. And uh, so that's, so I would urge Indians to stop all these stupid internal squabbles uh, and pull together as a country and, and you know, invest in the country. The other um, thing you mentioned was about public engagement. Well, I think this is a duty of scientists. Scientists need to uh, engage with the public. This has two factors. One is taxpayers money is going to support science. So you owe it to the public to, to tell them why it's important, why what you're doing is interesting, etc. And a second thing is by public engagement, you also build up support for science. You, you communicate to the public why science is important, why it's exciting and why it's useful. Mm -hmm. and, and that generates enthusiasm for science among uh, the public so that then government can say, look, we want to spend more money on science and, and the public will support that. Uh, so uh, because, you know, some, supporting science is not like spending money on roads and hospitals. It doesn't have immediate feedback. So, so politicians have to make the case for it. Uh, now, you asked, well, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Um, the important science and interesting science. Oh yeah, so that's very much a personal issue. My feeling is you're, you're talking about importance and interesting as if they are uh, distinct, but there are areas of science which can be both interesting and important. That's probably the one to go for. I would say, don't be swayed too much by today's fashions because what's interesting and important today may be solved by the time you uh, become a professional scientist or may no longer be in fashion or may the, people might feel it was a dead end. So I think I would say you have to be interested in it. That's the first and most important criterion because that's what allows you to get up every morning and go to work with some enthusiasm, which is what you need. And I think probably that communication element that you talk about for scientists is applicable to every uh, professor. Uh, and to quote Richard Feynman, who's somebody who you quote now and again in your work, and I think you've been quite inspired by him. Uh, he said, if you cannot explain something in simple terms, you don't understand it. So I think we all have that duty to communicate. <laughs> Um, I've got several questions in the chat box um, about the mRNA vaccine. So I'm going to try and sort of agglomerate them. Um, one from uh, Sohini, one from Murari Jha, who's in fact a, a historian, but I guess uh, this is the School of Arts and Sciences. So I'm, I'm going to sort of summarize the, I think there are four different questions in total. Um, would the mRNA va vaccine has surpassed expectations and you will have been tracking the developments. Would your assessment be of it that the vaccine format is here to stay? Taking into account the COVID-19 vaccines, how would you assess in an Indian context, policymakers and regulatory bodies move towards starting the concept of quote, restricted emergency use, coming on the back of the fact that clinical trial data has been uh, opaque. And then um, finally, um, recently there was an essay by Andreas Klunt in Bloomberg titled mRNA vaccines could vanquish COVID today, cancer tomorrow, which talks about the advances in messenger RNA by a Hungarian scientist. How do you see the potential of mRNA for tackling a host of diseases in the near future? Yeah, so I think the mRNA technology, uh, it, is, it is really impressive how, uh, you know, efficacious the vaccine is. 
but more importantly, what it does allow you to do is if you get uh, a different coronavirus or a different uh, variant of this COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, it can allow you to very quickly retool your vaccine. Uh, and, and you could even have a mixture uh, that allows you to tackle multiple strains uh, at once. So I, I think you know there's a lot of potential there, and the fact that you could uh, you know have a stable mRNA that produces a particular uh, protein obviously has lots of other broader importance to therapeutics. Uh, so uh, there's no question that the technology is very powerful, uh, that it's very flexible, and 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 has a number of advantages. Uh, what they need to do is work on the problems of distribution. For example, having ultra low temperatures for distribution, which make distribution in uh, you know, some countries more difficult. Uh, they need to think about cost uh, because uh, currently they cost you know, several times uh, the cost of uh, say the AstraZeneca vaccine or um, vaccines developed in uh, China or India. Uh, a third question is about uh, the lack of clinical trials. Uh, I know that there is uh, a public health emergency, but there are a number of vaccines which have already gone through clinical trials. And I think most of us would be very wary of uh, lowering standards uh, to, to fast track uh, a vaccine. I think it's very important to know that a vaccine actually works. And, you know, so there are, I would say, for the vaccines that have not undergone clinical trials, they need to produce those data as quickly as possible. Mm. And in the meantime, we should be using the vaccines which are, uh, you know, have gone through those uh, trials. Uh, that's my view, but that's a scientist's view. And, a, and this is the difference between science and policy. Politicians often have to act uh, as they see fit. They're the ones who are elected. They're the ones who have to make the decision. And uh, so really, ultimately, it's really up to governments to decide uh, what they want to do. OK, thank you. Um, we've now got quite a few questions in the chat box. Because we're in reasonably good time, it should be possible for the students to ask them uh, directly. So I'll start with Haley Desai. Uh, you should be able to uh, unmute and ask your, your question to Dr. Ramakrishnan. Thank you, sir. Uh, so it is a great pleasure for me to be able to communicate with you. Um, so my question is uh, very, uh, very common and very simple. Um, what kept you going? Um, I mean, for such a journey, for such a successful journey, I would say, um, there is always something down there that keeps you going. And my uh, question is from the point of view of a hobby, um, be it music, be it arts. So was there something along with your research work that kept you going? I, I think, you know, first of all, success is only evaluated in hindsight, you know. And when somebody's successful, people look for kind of clues in their career that might have led to success, but actually there's a lot of noise and luck in the system, you know? So if you were to clone say 10 Venkis and put them on the same career path, there's no guarantee that all 10 would have been successful, okay? Yeah. So in fact, I, I doubt that it, you know any of them might have been. So I, I think one shouldn't attribute, see too much into uh, this kind of hindsight evaluation. Uh, but if you ask what kept me going, well, I have always had a good sense. Well, first of all, I had a plan B and C, remember? Uh, I was willing to keep give myself options, but if they didn't work out, I was willing to, I'd have to do something else. After all, I, had, I'd, I was married, I had two kids, uh, you know, I needed a job. I couldn't just, you know, I, uh, I wasn't landed gentry or some, you know, uh, <laughs> heir to some sort of fortune. So, so I'd have to do whatever I could. Okay, so I, I think you have to somehow just be uh, flexible. What kept me going through hard times? Uh, first of all, having a supportive spouse does help and having, you know, kids who 
uh, you know, you enjoy uh, also helps. But having a lot of hobbies and other interests uh, also helped. So I was never one of these people who worked uh, 24 seven. You know, I often would take most of my weekends, I would take off uh, mm -hmm. to spend with my family. I had a lot of hobbies. Uh, I, I like to read. Uh, I read Patrick's book for, you know, through uh, some of my difficult times. Uh, and it's quite a, quite a weighty tome, I should say. And uh, so, you know, uh, there we are. So, so there are lots of things you can do to ease that stress of, 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 of your work. Thanks. Okay, so let's now go to Astik uh, Priya. Uh, you should be able to ask your, your question. Uh, first of all, I must say I'm really pleased to hear you all. And uh, I have to say one thing, sir, that the way you are vibing just on a video call, it makes you feel so great that I got the opportunity to listen to you. And I would be really great if I ever get a chance to meet you in person. And, yeah, well, we uh, can't question, even see you, though. Yeah, you need to turn on your video first. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> but there is some issue here. That's the reason. Sir, my question is, like apart from all the research work and stuff, like if you would not have been dot, Dr. Venki Ramakrishnan and what you would have been, like if you wouldn't have been a scientist, which field you have chosen for yourself? Yeah, you well, you have plan I, B you know, and C. So I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, the, the Financial Times asked me exactly that. Like, what would you have done if you hadn't been a scientist? And what I, I'll tell you the answer I gave them. I said, if I had the talent and the courage, I would have like to be a musician or a writer, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, it's far too late for me to be a musician, but I am trying to write my, I've just started, accepted a, a contract to write my second book, which is to be on, it's called Is Death Necessary? Which is what, or why we, and how we age and die. So uh, I found, found I liked the act of writing, uh, you know, when I wrote Gene Machine. And the idea that you sit there and try to distill your thoughts onto a page and try and communicate with this anonymous audience, uh, you know, this, this audience that you don't know at all uh, that's out there. Uh, so uh, not, not anonymous, but this invisible audience. Uh, so uh, so those, are, those are things. So I, 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 I do have a feeling that when I retire, which will be in a few years, I might want to take up writing uh, full time. I, I, I notice that you have a great eye for detail, in fact, so I can see that you have the, the mind of the writer, uh, the, the, <laughs> the eye of the writer. Um, I, I'm just going to ask one question from uh, an outside visitor to the call, uh, Dr. Ishan Pandya, who, who wants to ask you why 77S ribosomes are not being explored in detailed research. Um, sorry. Can you tell? Can you can he tell me a bit more about these ribosomes, Dr. Pandya? Are you able to um, unmute and tell us more about 77S ribosomes? Okay, we might come back to Dr. Dr. Pandya. In the meantime, let's have um, Pranay Reddy has a, a question for you. Ready, ready. You should. Oh, Dr. Ishan Pandya, you you can now. Uh, you can now ask. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, very good evening from India, and sir, it is a very great meeting and uh, honor to talk with you, sir. My center of the question is that yet today the variety of the ribosomes have been discovered. 60, 70, 80 variety of the units have been discovered. In between the time of the 1865, few of the scientists discovered about the 77S ribosomes. While this was the source from the fungi. Now my question is that the fungi are the sources of the antibiotics also. Then why doesn't the same antibiotics do not activate the, the 77S ribosomes? Yeah. So first of all, I, ribosomes from yeast, which is another fungi, have been solved to very high resolution. And it's very unlikely that these other ribosomes are going to be that different. The other thing I should say is that most antibiotics are not made by, uh, most ribosomal antibiotics are actually made by other bacteria. They're not made by fungi. They're made by one genus is responsible for a large number of them called 
and that genus is Streptomyces, which is a soil back, which, so, which are soil bacteria. And the reason that they don't <coughs> kill themselves uh, with these bacteria, uh, with these antibiotics, is because they modify their own ribosomes so that the in those pockets, so that those antibiotics don't fit into those pockets, Excellent. okay? And they don't block their own ribosomes. So it's a, it's a good question, but uh, bacteria have clearly evolved uh, uh, to, to deal with this problem. And sir, my second question is that, sir, the ribosomes that are self-synthesized inside the cell or either they are a foreign particle and behaving as an endosymbiont for a cell. Oh, they're, uh, they're not foreign at all, except to viruses. Viruses obviously need their own, need the host ribosomes, uh, but uh, they're entirely uh, uh, synthesized uh, inside the cell. That's just uh, a, a basic uh, fact of molecular biology. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot for answering. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. I'm going to ask a question from the chat box from Swati Joshi who's a PhD student at IIT Gantinhage in Medical Humanities. He wants to know, how did your early training in physics help you when you came to study the intricacies of the ribosome? Yeah, it's a good question. And one is that there are a number of physicists who go into biology and never stop being physicists. Uh, and they often come to biology with a kind of arrogance that they're physicists, they're much smarter and they're going to solve uh, the deepest problems in biology. And they usually fall flat on their face and don't actually have uh, much impact. The physicists who do well in biology are people who effectively become biologists and learn biology, learn what the questions are. And then at some point, they might apply a, a kind of methodology or a mindset that they'd learn from physics to tackle a biological problem. So in my case, I think what physics did was gave me an appreciation for signal to noise. It made it easy for me to learn crystallography, which is essentially a physical technique. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, I'd go to these synchrotrons and I wasn't intimidated by these very complicated instruments because I had a con conceptual understanding of what was going on and how they worked. And so in that sense, uh, it indirectly helped me. But before it could help me, I had to become a biologist. I had to think about the ribosome and what it meant and how to tackle it and how to prepare biological samples of the ribosome and get it to crystallize. So there were lots and lots of biology involved, which I would never have learned if I had stayed a physicist. That's a, a very interesting kind of total switch that you made. Uh, from one to the other rather than staying in your old place and just reaching out to the new place you actually made the conceptual adjustment yeah. um we we've got a question uh from pranay reddy who yeah. will now ask you yeah i'm sorry for before i couldn't uh, unmute through zoom uh, zoom has a mind of its own i guess well uh, sir it's a it's wonderful to have this conversation with you i would love to ask you a lot of questions honestly and i wish i can in the future but for now, I just want to get your opinion and views. And I think you've alluded to this a bit before about how, how big a role politicians and politics, or rather people who are not necessarily scientists, play a role in how science should be defined right now. You know, and uh, to yeah. me, I find, find it a bit troubling. And I want to get your views on that. And I hope if, if, if there's a one good thing that has come out of this pandemic, people realize especially the politicians, they realize the importance of scientists. What do you think? Is there, can there be a change with this? Yeah, no, I think the, the dance between politics and science is a very old one. And I think Britain has a rather good view about this and it's called the Haldane principle, not named after JBS Haldane who eventually settled and died in India, but a different Haldane. But, his idea was the following, his principle was the following. It is not up to scientists to decide what the broad priorities should be. For example, if the government decides that we need to tackle the problem of old age or of cancer or, or COVID, 
that is the decision of the government because they're the ones who were elected to govern, okay? But having decided the large priorities, it should then be left up to the scientists how to implement those priorities. An example is the war on cancer, which was started by Richard Nixon. Now, that was a government initiative, but Richard Nixon cannot tell scientists that, oh, I want you to tackle this particular kind of cancer using drugs. Okay, I want you to develop drugs for cancer, uh, for breast cancer, for example, because it's up to scientists to decide what are the most fruitful ways uh, right now where we can make headway. We need to understand basic biology. We need to understand uh, this, that, or the other. So uh, it is up to scientists to figure out how to implement the priorities of the government, but it's up to government to set the priorities. Okay, so I think that is the way to look at it. So an, an, another question that's come in in the chat box is about uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance, which is a particular issue in India. Um, do you have any uh, comments that you would like to make on that and ways of tackling it? Well, clearly we need to develop new antibiotics, but that's only part of the problem. Uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. Partly you need good sanitation control. You need good hygiene to prevent transmission. You need good diagnostics so that you're not giving antibiotics when they're not going to be effective, okay? So you need to know what bacterium it is or is it even a bacterium? Uh, it's, if it's a virus, then there's no point in giving an antimicrobial, anti, antibacterial antibiotic. Mm -hmm. so, so there are a lot of parallel approaches apart from developing uh, good drugs. And then part of the equation is that giving antibiotics only when appropriate uh, has another angle, which is you can't just go to some chemists and simply buy whatever you want, you know, even the third generation antibiotic. I know, you know, when I go to India, I can buy anything I want uh, at, the, at, at any street chemist. You know, I, all I go uh, write down on a piece of paper what I want and they'll give it to me without a prescription. And that's not a good uh, recipe. And, and, you know, so I think there are a number of both social and scientific issues uh, that need to be addressed. Can I now pass over to Excuse Professor uh, Vivek uh, Tanavde? Uh, he has a, a question which I, I have said I rather relished, which is how to improve the average. Uh, Vivek, do you want to ask it um, directly? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, so it was wonderful listening to you, Professor Ramakrishnan. And you alluded to um, uh, very briefly saying that in the 50s, the best Indian science uh, uh, and, and my interpretation was that uh, even at that time and probably more so today, there is a huge gap between the best of Indian science versus the average of Indian science. And when I look at countries like China, and I do uh, teach in China uh, quite a bit, I see that uh, the average Chinese science is a lot better than the average Indian science. And, and so the question is, how do we address this? What do we do to, to address this issue? Well, the trouble is that if you don't invest a lot in science, your investment is often limited. Uh, it's either you can spread it too thin and then nobody will benefit, or it's limited to few elite institutions, you know, uh, the National Institutes in Delhi and Indian Institute of Science, TIFR, the ICERS, you know, there, you can, there are about a dozen or two dozen of these uh, elite institutions. Uh, and uh, one thing that's different from when I was growing up in India and now uh, is that when I was growing up, universities were often uh, fairly good in science. They had at least one or two professors, one or two people in each department who was doing some reasonably good work. And over the next two or three decades, the focus shifted away from universities to these sort of central institutes, you know, and that I think was a decoupled education from research, which the government is trying to reverse now with these ICERs and so on. But I think there's no alternative to more investment. You can't raise the average unless you engage, you know, have more money to, 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 to improve the average. And 
that ha can't come from the government alone. And so I think private institutions uh, like Ahmedabad University or Ashoka University uh, have a role to play, at, not only by themselves, but as a role model of what the private sector can do uh, to improve Indian education. And it can't just be for upper middle class and rich kids, okay? It has to be more widespread than that. So even private institutions need to make it possible for anyone who's got sufficient talent to be able to attend them. So that's another goal that you might uh, want to aspire to. So, so just, just to mention that at Ahmedabad, we do have quite a wide admissions policy, um, including around one in five students coming from a first time learner family. So we're very aware of that need to bring people in on merit or, or at least let's say potential talent, the undergraduates of the future becoming the good graduates of the future. Yeah. Um, I had one personal closing question uh, for you, which was about what comes next. Uh, I mean, presumably with the Royal Society, behind you as of December, you, you can get back in the lab in a way that you've not been able to do for the last five years. Yeah, so my, the Royal Society is a non-paying honorary position. Mm -hmm. And when I accepted the job, I uh, told them I could give them two days a week. And uh, uh, the, the executive director of the Royal Society laughed at me when she heard that. She said she, I should have talked to her first, <laughs> but, uh, by the way, I have you frozen, Patrick. Oh, are you? Can you hear me? I can still hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, uh, so it's a so, but with Brexit and then COVID, it rapidly uh, became much more than that, and the result was that my lab was sort of coasting along thanks to some very talented people, uh, without much in the way of you know, direct leadership from me, except occasionally. Uh, what it does now is allow me to come back full time and really start thinking about uh, problems. But as I pointed out, I only have a few years left uh, before I essentially wind down my lab. I'm not one of these people who believes in sort of hanging on till the bitter end. Uh, and so I thought, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, if my next book, uh, does well, then I could sort of think about other books to write, perhaps uh, write essays, uh, you know, things. I know Max Perutz, who founded this lab, would often write for the New York Review of Books. Uh, so, you know, there are uh, other avenues for uh, people like me. And just gen there are many ways to be a generally good citizen of the science community. Uh, so I'm hoping to, uh, to do that, more of that. Well, that's, that's, that's wonderful to learn. And thank you for engaging so vigorously with students, faculty, <laughs> visitors uh, at Ahmedabad University today from, from Cambridge. Yeah, I only UK. wish it had been uh, in person. It would have been great to sort of uh, come to Ahmedabad. And the and, next time, you know, next time and, we'll have you also, back in Gujarat. Yeah. This is the season for undhu, which is a, a famous Gujarati dish, and which I like. So, you know, it uh, would have been a great... <laughs> Great occasion. So, <laughs> so I'll just I'll just hand over now to Simran uh, Nasra, who will um, will play us out. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, thank you for joining us today. We are extremely grateful to have had the opportunity to interact with you. It was very exciting and enlightening conversation. Engaging with you had encouraged us to explore the complex ideas in great details and so as to advance our understanding in the field of research. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Professor Patrick French for moderating and leading today's event. Thank you all for joining us at Ahmedabad University and School of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir.